Okay, this video is from the book Metabolic Reformation. I'm sorry, the Medical Reformation. This is chapter 12 about fructose, the effect of dietary fructose on health. And this diagram is a little complicated, but I think it's useful because uh, it'll give you a better understanding of fructose. Fructose is different than glucose. Glucose is the energy of life. Glucose goes everywhere in your body. Your brain especially really wants to use glucose for its energy metabolism. Whereas fructose mostly goes from your gut. Here's your gut right here. It gets absorbed primarily into the portal vein, and that's the vein that connects the gut to the liver, and then it goes up through the portal vein into the liver. And most of the fructose gets metabolized in the liver, and there's something very unusual about, about how it's metabolized in comparison with glucose. The liver's job is to make sure that the brain has enough blood glucose uh, during the fasting phase of metabolism. So the liver is great at handling glucose. It only burns glucose when it needs to, okay? Um, glucose comes into the liver, and it undergoes the first reactions in glycolysis. That's the cycle for burning carbohydrates located in the cytoplasm. And the key regulatory step is right here, PFK, phosphofructokinase. That is very tightly regulated. So it will only allow glucose to enter this pathway when it needs to burn glucose. It doesn't burn glucose for no good reason because it wants to maintain its stores of glucose in the form of glycogen so it has them available when it needs to release glucose into the bloodstream to maintain good blood glucose levels for the brain. Okay, with fructose, it's not like that. Fructose sort of is playing its own separate game. Fructose comes into the liver and it is then uh, converted into a three-carbon uh, carbohydrate and it enters the glycolysis at the midway point, at the halfway point. So glycolysis starts out being six carbon sugars. Both fructose and glucose are six carbon sugars. But fructose enters the glycolysis pathway at the midway point, at the halfway point, where you've now switched to, you know, fructose, normally the sugar, six carbon sugar gets cut into a three carbon sugar. And then it just runs through the second half of the pathway relatively quickly. The point is that the second half of the pathway, where you're dealing with three carbon units, they're not tightly regulated. So the fact that fructose enters at the three carbon phase, it rapidly runs through the back part. And the liver can't control it so well. When you eat a fruit, the fruit has a lot of fiber. you got to chew it. you got to digest it. All of that slows things down. But if you're just drinking one of those energy drinks or, you know, some big gulp soda pop or some other sweetened drink, sweetened beverage, whatever it might be, where it's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, which can be anywhere from, like, it can even be 65% fructose. All that fructose comes in very rapidly. There's no fiber in those drinks typically. So they get rapidly absorbed and they go right into the liver as a bolus in a big uh, amount. And they run down the second half of glycolysis because there's no regulatory step to slow things down. And the liver has nothing to do with them. Okay, it produces these, you know, pyruvic gets, you know, converted to acetyl-CoA, a two-carbon unit, the acetyl group. And the liver has nothing to do. It says, oh, screw it, just make it into fat. So that tends to promote a fatty liver, which is not good. Okay, the fatty liver over time is basically like having diabetes of the liver, pre-diabetes, diabetes of the liver. And it will decrease the liver's ability to accurately sense and regulate the blood glucose level. So in a sense, it's like having diabetes of the liver. You don't want that. Um, it also have a tendency to make the person gain weight and get fatter. It's all bad. You'll, you'll tend to become hyperlipidemic, increase your blood lipids. All of that is bad, which increases your risk of atherosclerosis. All right, the next thing that happens is that the fructose rapidly gets converted into these three carbon units for the second half of glycolysis. In the process, the initial step is to phosphorylate the fructose to fructose 1,6-phosphate. So the ATP is donating a phosphate and it becomes ADP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Once it gives up its phosphate to fructose, it now becomes ADP. And then D is for dye, having two phosphates. Well, the relevance is that this ADP tends to be metabolized into uric acid. And then the uric acid is released into the blood. And this uric acid, when it's present in high amounts, as might occur after drinking high fructose corn syrup, uh, sweetened you know, junk food uh, processed beverages and soda pop, um, will have a couple bad effects. So it will increase SANS. SANS is sympathetic autonomic nervous system. That predisposes to hypertension. Uric acid is also a bridging molecule, and that increases, that means it has a relatively positive charge in, in vivo 
and can um, overcome the zeta potential, stick red blood cells together. Dr. Sloop has written papers about that. Okay, so now you got two things contributing to hypertension, but there's actually a third thing contributing to hypertension. It'll have a tendency to inhibit ENOS. ENOS is endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So that means the endothelial cells, the arterial lining cells, they make nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the most important vasodilator in the whole human body. So if you inhibit that, then you make it more difficult for arteries to open up. Um, and that's a problem. So you're going to be vasoconstricted. It's similar to the effect of dietary sodium. When you vasoconstrict, it means you clamp down on the diameter of your arteries. That's bad, because if your heart's pumping blood, your main job of your heart is to pump blood to the top of your brain. Okay, That's why you have blood pressure, to pump against gravity uh, and get blood to the top of your brain. And what I'm saying is if all your arteries are con relatively constricted and narrowed, the heart has to pump higher, um, generates a higher blood pressure, and that high blood pressure can damage arteries predisposed to atherosclerosis. There's another problem with this. After you eat a meal, you get some glucose going into the blood, and then what's supposed to happen is insulin is supposed to come up. Insulin sends a message to the skeletal muscle. There's glucose available. Take this glucose into your skeletal muscle and store it as glycogen, for example. Uh, but one of the things that normally happens, if you have a skeletal muscle, like let's say here's your muscle, when you're at rest, usually most, a lot of the capillaries, they're, they're narrowed or closed down. Hardly anything is going through them because you don't need them to be open when you're not using the muscle. Okay, so what's my point? The point is after you eat a meal, the insulin increases nitric oxide in your muscle so that it'll open up capillaries so the insulin will have access to all the skeletal muscle tissue and it can send its message of, yes, glucose is available, take it up into your skeletal muscle cell and store it as glycogen. So when the uric acid is elevated in the skeletal muscle after eating lots of fructose, it can inhibit that endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So you'll decrease your nitric oxide, meaning you'll decrease your vasodilator. Because your vasodilator is decreasing your muscle, you won't have, your muscle capillaries will stay closed largely. And what that means is the insulin can't get access to that skeletal muscle, and therefore you can't get the glucose into those skeletal muscle. So it causes insulin resistance. So that's the point. Large amounts of high fructose corn syrup coming in, the fructose coming in rapidly as a bolus, will decrease the muscle's ability to take up glucose. It will cause insulin resistance. You don't want that. That means it'll increase your risk of diabetes and worsening diabetes. In addition, when you have high insulin, hyperinsulinemia because of insulin resistance, there's something in the blood called insulin degrading enzyme that removes insulin. Okay, but it can only be produced in limited amounts. And it has a secondary job. It's higher affinity for removing insulin, but it has a secondary job of also removing beta amyloid protein. So when you've got your um, insulin degrading enzyme, IDE, tied up with uh, removing these high amounts of insulin because of the insulin resistance, that means they're less able to remove the beta amyloid. So beta amyloid will start to accumulate, and it can accumulate in the brain. And this is the reason why people say excessive amounts of high fructose corn syrup can, in this form, this is a mechanism by which they can contribute to dementia by leading to hyperinsulinemia because of insulin resistance. And secondarily, that tying up the insulin-degrading enzyme, which also is for removal of beta amyloid, thus beta amyloid protein accumulates more. Beta amyloid can have an excitotoxin effect on brain cells. I have totally separate lectures about all that, but I'm just trying to go through this because you'll hear some guys. The two big guys that promote, um, that, that talk a lot about all the problems with fructose are a guy named Lustig. I think it's Robert Lustig. He's a pretty famous guy. He's got a, like this YouTube video called The Bitter Truth About, uh, about Fructose. It's got like millions and millions of views. And this other guy, I think his name is Richard Johnson. He's a nephrologist who did a lot of research on uh, hypertension and trying to understand later uric acid. And they're both of the conclusion that fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup, is a major problem for human health and metabolism. Okay, I would say, you know, fructose, Lustig's a very smart guy. He's very intelligent, very articulate, very enjoyable speaker, entertaining writer. I've read his books. I've watched his videos. I like all that. However, I do have a disagreement with him. Here's my disagreement with him. I think he overemphasizes the problems with fructose. It's a convenient scapegoat. Oh, the meat is not a problem. It's really the fructose. So every food industry always wants to blame health problems on some other aspect of nutrition. And so what I'm saying is, yes, I do think high fructose corn syrup is a problem. It's not good for your health. 
but it's not that bad. And I also think there's a big difference between high fructose corn syrup and a fruit. Fruits come packaged with all these other nutrients and with fiber, slows down digestion. So fruits, I think, are relatively good. Some of the modern ones are extra sweetened. You know, they've been sort of genetically engineered to be that way. And those can cause some rebound hypoglycemia even. But in general, still, fruits are pretty healthy. If you look around and also, and just your the evidence of your eyeballs, there's lots of really healthy you know, long distance runners and stuff eating lots and lots of fruits and they're pretty healthy. These are also though relatively young people who exercise a lot because you'll get a lot of this fructose going into the liver and, you know, in, in some cases being stored as fat like we talked about here. You're not elevating the blood glucose levels much and they don't provide as much as satisfaction to hunger. So what am I getting at here? What I'm saying is that, let's say I eat a big bowl of starch, a big bowl of rice, beans, potatoes and whatnot. I'm full, even after I'm full completely full. I can't eat another bite. You could put a similar size bowl full of full of tons of fruit. I know from experience, I'll be able to eat all that fruit. It doesn't satisfy hunger as well as starch does. And I think that's a big part of it because it doesn't raise blood glucose levels so much. So there is a potential for overeating with some of these sweet fruits especially. So you got to be a little careful about that, especially if you are older and you don't exercise as much. Okay, A lot of these Fruit, fruit, fruit to the max are people like this guy, Michael Arnstein. He's that ultra marathoner. The guy moved to Hawaii so he could eat more fruit. I thought that was kind of funny. It's cheaper, more available, seasonal all year round. And then there's the two mastering diabetes. And I like those guys. That's uh, like Bobby Bittero and Cyrus Kumbata. Okay, so uh, they're eating tons of fruit. But they're still relatively young, very athletic guys. Okay, but this, this is a useful diagram. You might want to hit the print screen button on this one. Because this explains a whole bunch of issues. When you hear about fructose, this puts it all together. Okay, so I did talk about the fruit. Um, and the fruit only has a little bit of fructose in it, usually about 5 grams per serving versus you can get a giant bolus in these processed foods. Fruit also has the vasodilators built into it, the potassium, the magnesium, it has the antioxidants, it has vitamin C, which increases uric acid excretion from the body, um, and all these things slow down the absorption of the fructose rather than the processed food where it comes in like a bolus because there's no fiber. Um, I usually abbreviate fructose FRC. Okay, let's see, what else we got here? Uh, we talked about the over, when you overrun glycolysis the end product is a seal ends up goes to pyruvate three carbon unit going to acetyl coa when that liver has nothing to do with it makes it into fat processed food also tends to contain a lot of other bad stuff it tends to be very high in sodium msg mfg all of which can make foods hyper palatable lead to overeating and are bad for your health processed foods often also contain a lot of the herbicide glyphosate gp so i usually abbreviate it this lady stephanie sentence made a whole bunch of lectures about that she wrote a good book about it called toxic legacy as well non-organic gmo corns often sprayed with atrazine herbicide very estrogenic those are fat storage hormones i would call them obesogens as well a lot of them are neurotoxic as well okay another key point about high fructose corn syrup is it's often contaminated with mercury that used to be related to processing it through chloralkali vats um, there was a lady, was her name Dufo, Renee Dufo. She wrote an entire book uh, about food toxins and a lot of emphasis on uh, high fructose corn syrup being contaminated by mercury. I actually knew a molecular biologist who had a friend who did research on high fructose corn syrup being contaminated by mercury. And when he published his paper, they fired the guy. Big food companies got him fired because you know they don't like people telling the the, the truth to the public. And the funny thing too about high fructose corn syrup, it used to be called by some companies a food preservative. And I'm laughing is because it was a food pre food preservative because the mercury was toxic, okay? But they wouldn't mention because the mercury, they would just say high fructose corn syrup is a, is a preservative, okay? I can remember they used to put uh, mercury in the contact lenses, okay? You know, and the solution for preserving contact lenses prevent them from becoming infected. Okay, so what was the point of all this? That processed foods increase the risk of fatty liver and obesity. We kind of already knew that, but I kind of explained the role played by fructose. Um, fructose metabolic pathway also generates uric acid, elevated blood levels of uric acid occurring about 30, within 30 to 60 minutes after eating. Okay, we talked about how it can be a bridging molecule prothrombotic. Gregory Sloop, MD, did research on that. Um, we talked about how it increases insulin resistance. Okay, here's one paper 
about insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is what causes diabetes, and especially, you know, fat, especially saturated fat, but all fats eventually lead to insulin resistance. Okay, here's a causal role for uric acid in fructose-induced metabolic syndrome. This is paper here. Okay, worldwide epidemic of metabolic syndrome. Fructose raises uric acid levels in the blood, okay, and these lead to decrease in nitric oxide. Okay, well, the decrease in nitric oxide means less uh, vasodilation inside the skeletal muscle, meaning that insulin can't get to the rest of the muscle so that it can't do its job and let the glucose get into the muscle to be stored as glycogen. Normally, a huge percentage of your postprandial uh, glucose in the blood should go into the muscle as glycogen. You know, so if it's not getting in there, then it stays high in the blood. You know, diabetes, hyperglycemia, okay, for due to the insulin resistance, okay. Okay, um, they said the fructose but not the dextrose and the glucose-related stuff was causing uh, symptoms of metabolic syndrome diabetes. Let's look at the rest of this paper here. Okay, if they gave allopurinol, allopurinol to lower the uric acid levels in the blood, they were able to prevent the metabolic syndrome effects. They were able to prevent the fructose-induced hyperinsulinemia, they mean insulin resistance. Um, and the systolic hypertension. You know, from the, remember we talked about uric acid contributing to systolic hypertension by increasing SAN, sympathetic autonomic nervous system, causing increased sodium resorption. The fructose also does that. Um, and you get less hypertriglyceridemia, I mean less triglycerides in the blood, and you end up having less weight gain. <laughs> so uric acid inhibit endothelial function manifested by reduced vasodilation. Yeah, because of decreased nitric oxide. Okay, so we talked about all that. So this is what I'm saying. These are problems with it. That's why I, I would never eat anything with high fructose corn syrup. You know, I'm 60 years old now, and I want to keep my health. I don't, you know, I just say to myself, why would I put anything in my body that's that's harmful to me? I just wouldn't do it. Okay, um, here's just showing the anatomy in a little more detail. So here's the bowel, your gut. And then when you absorb the fructose, it goes into this vein, typically SMV, superior mesenteric vein. Then it goes, that floats up to the portal vein. Then the portal vein goes into the liver. And then the liver is like the giant metabolic workhorse. The way this drawing is, is actually not fully to scale. The liver is much bigger than the spleen, typically. It's typically at, at least twice, if not three times, as big as the spleen. Okay, if you get liver failure with cirrhosis and it gets all scarred and fibrotic, you can get back pressure in the portal vein and it can even make the blood flow backwards. But that's really, really rare. I see tons of patients with liver seeds, tons of them, okay? And I hardly ever see reverse flow in the portal vein. Yeah, I do sometimes see it, but it's quite rare in comparison with garden variety fatty liver. If garden variety fatty liver is present in about three out of four people I see over the age of 50. Uh, you know, full-blown cirrhosis with reverse flow. In the, well, cirrhosis is actually quite common too, but full-blown reversal of flow in the portal vein is actually relatively uncommon. So even with cirrhosis, I, you don't, I usually don't see a full-blown reverse flow in the portal vein. Okay. Severe chronic fatty liver can lead to liver cirrhosis. It's becoming one of the most common reasons for liver transplant now, progression of fatty liver. It'll go from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFL, then it'll become NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, the itis meaning inflammation. Inflammation is very commonly followed by fibrosis, then the liver becomes all fibrosed, less able to do its job. Okay, when it's real severe, you can lead to back pressure causing the spleen to get big, splenomegaly, Patient premature dies. So anyways, that's all we're going to say about fructose. So basically, what's my point? I think fruits are relatively healthy to eat, but you got to be a little careful. I can tell you, Dr. McDougall's not a big fan of fruits. He sort of believes you should be eating close to 90% of your calories from starch, and then you can throw in a little bit of, uh, you know, 85 to 90% of your calories from starch. You can throw in a little bit of fruits for maybe 5 or 10% of your calories, and then eat some vegetables for the rest of them, Okay. I think if you're exercising a lot, you're relatively healthy, you can eat a higher percentage of calories from fruits, you know, maybe more in the ballpark of around 30 to 40 percent. It depends how much you exercise, and you got to see how you how you feel, how you're doing. There's some fruits who I stopped eating, for example, like apples, because I found that when I eat apples, I liked them so much, I could eat 10, 12, 15, just like that. So they didn't, unlike starch, which fills me up and I stop eating with the apples, I would just keep eating them as many as there were. I even wondered if they were spraying something on them externally, like... Um, like MST or something. I wonder, because why do they taste so good? And you know how the these apples are. They all look the same, even though they call them organic. They look a little too good. So I wondered about that. Nowadays, I think they're putting that AP, you know what, something, something L on them, just like they're doing on avocados. So that's another reason why I don't eat apples anymore. 
Uh, one has to be careful about that sort of thing. So anyways, I hope this lecture on fructose was helpful. I wouldn't eat anything with high fructose corn syrup in it.